Good evening. I am Nigel Bovey. I'm the Vice Chair of the Chris Edmund Society. Welcome to Questions of Our Times. Today's topic is truth. In a world of fake news, who can we trust? My guest today is a man who, when he was a cabinet member, was tipped to be a future prime minister. Any hopes he may have entertained in that direction died the day he was found guilty at the Old Bailey of perjury and perverting the course of justice. From cabinet seat to prison bench in record time, my guest was headline news. Announcing the verdict, the Guardian's banner headline read, he lied and lied and lied. These days, my guest handles truth. He is an Anglican, Anglican priest whose duties include chaplaincy at Pentonville Prison, where in fact he has been working today. He also works as a journalist, often writing about the justice system and prison reform. He is in great demand as a speaker and as a preacher. In fact, last Christmas, he conducted the Old Bailey Carroll Service, a scenario he could barely have imagined the day he stood in that very same courtroom in the dock, waiting his sentence. To talk with me today about trust and truth is the Reverend Jonathan Aitken. Jonathan, welcome. It is so lovely to see you. Hello, good evening. Well done. <laughs> good evening. We made it. <laughs> Excellent. It's good to see you. Jonathan, before politics, uh, well, and of course most people will know you uh, probably uh, for, for being a politician in John Major's uh, cabinet, you were a journalist. Where did you work as a journalist and what did you do? And what did that particular form of, a journal, a particular form of journal, journalism involve? Well, I did spend the first 10 years of my professional working life as what was then called a Fleet Street journalist. But immediately before that, I had my first job in journalism, which, and I kid you not, was to be assistant tennis and funerals correspondent of the eighth Anglian Daily Times. I was hard for that job, I sometimes joked that not for the speed of my shorthand, but for the speed at which I could change my, my clothes. My boss corresponded the evening star of the uh, East Anglian Daily Times, and I had to rush, or he had to rush, from funeral to tennis match, and he needed an assistant who could double up for him. From then I really went to Fleet Street, mainly for the evening standard, uh, and I was an ordinary reporter and a feature writer. And then I got a rather exciting break at the age of 23. Suddenly a chance came up to go and be a war correspondent in Vietnam. And I loved the danger and the excitement of the good reporting of that war, indeed, one or two other subsequent wars. I did all kinds of things in Fleet Street for various papers um, and wrote extensively. And at the same time, I also wrote books. In an early age, I had three or four books published and I've gone on having books published. Um, I think 17 is my total of books. So I've been a writer and still in a small way, I'm a journalist today. So journalism was an important part of my life. Uh, you say you wrote books. You you actually have written a number of biographies, n not least uh, perhaps in the earlier days. You, you wrote a, a biography of Richard Nixon. And also, uh, subsequent to that, you wrote a book about uh, an, a, a biography of Chuck Colson, both of whom, of course, were involved in Watergate. Um, what's the fascination do you have with corruption and politics? I actually don't think I have a great fascination with corruption politics, what I do have a great fascination with is a good story. And both Nixon and Colson and two other biographers I've written, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace and Margaret Thatcher, they both had amazing, all had amazing stories. Now, there were dark clouds in Nixon's story and Colson's story, and indeed in Newton's story, he was in jail, <laughs> flogged by the Royal Navy. But um, I follow the story, not any particular theme. Let's, let's go to your trial then, because this is where you came into prominence, as it were, beyond politics to, to, to the every, every man, every woman in the street. You became a household name, uh, and it's, it's a good 20 to 25 years ago, but nevertheless, that still stays with you, doesn't it? Around the time of your trial, you announced that you would, and I quote, start a fight to cut out the cancer of bent and twisted journalism with the simple sword of truth. Jonathan Aitken, how did that work out? 
catastrophically bad at it. Um, <laughs> uh, I sometimes have to um, watch that clip myself. It sort of comes up in news quizzes sometimes. And when I watch it, I um, sort of squirm with embarrassment and regret. And I say to myself sometimes, well, who is that Burke up there, obviously telling porkies, which I'm afraid was what was happening. And I was fighting back at a moment of intense pressure and excitement. I was um, denying um, some of the stuff anyway, the Guardian had written in the headlines. And in a moment of foolish hyperbole, I said, and I'll go for them and I'll fight with the sword of truth. Couldn't have been a worse metaphor. Uh, anyway, <laughs> been much so, mocked ever since. So, so just for those who may have forgotten, or those who are actually new to the to the whole um, soap opera that was your life at that time, why were you in court, and why were you suing the Guardian? Well, I was in court basically because basically because of my career. Uh, I was in the cabinet. Uh, I was tipped for being a future Prime Minister. That is not an exclusive honour, I should quickly say, to fill Wembley Stadium with a number of people who have been <laughs> tipped wrongly at being future Prime Minister. But still, I was sort of in the frame, as it were. And at this point, um, I got a no, no more than a tiny bit of very mild embarrassment, uh, but I made it infinitely worse by telling a lie about it. The embarrassment was that I unwisely but not legally wrongly, accepted the hospitality of a friend who happened to be a Saudi businessman. And as a minister, I should have been more careful. But that wasn't a hanging offence. What was a hanging offence, or at least a jailing offence in the end, was that afterwards, instead of saying, yes, that happened, or maybe I made an error of judgment, in which case I think the whole thing would have died without any real damage to me. But if instead I said, my wife paid the bill, uh, as no, we've got all that wrong. And that was the lie <coughs> which led to um, all kinds of huge trouble afterwards. And eventually I had to go to perjury and go so, to prison. So you, you told a lie under oath that your wife had paid the bill when it had actually been paid by your uh, Saudi friend while you were a member of yes. the government. And rather than actually yes, say, my, mis right. my mistake, my mistake, my, I'm sorry, you battled on and you said, you covered it up, basically, didn't you? Or you tried to cover That's it right. up. That's right. And so often, so often in political, many other kinds of life, it is not the actual offence. We were talking about Nixon, the moment, mm. Watergate, of which he genuinely knew nothing. It was nothing very serious about it. If he just says, well, my guy shouldn't have got out of control like this. Hmm. Instead, he told a huge uh, lot of lies about it, covered it up, and that in the end led to his resignation from the President of the United States. Having written his biography, I might have learned something from it, but I didn't. <laughs> it's, uh, um, around the time of, of your trial uh, and, and your exposure um, by The Guardian, you were in other... Um, outlets of the press. The press kind of um, were making up all sorts of stories. They were accusing you of being a pimp. They accused you of uh, consorting with prostitutes. They said you were an illegal arms dealer. When you went in prison, there was a tabloid uh, plot to, to get you drugged and have compromising photographs taken about you. Uh, you're quoted as saying that the British press is the best in the world and the worst in the world. A generation later, has your to what extent has your opinion changed about the about the the morals and and the practices of the, of the press? I think I would still agree with that statement, but I would qualify quite substantially. Uh, the British is still a wonderful press, probably livelier and more interesting than any other set of newspapers in the world. Um, I, being a dinosaur uh, who loves print journalism, I buy every morning uh, five daily newspapers. If I was in a wild, extravagant mood, I might buy another two. Um, occasionally <laughs> do. Now, in that kind of, of, of journalism, there's wonderful writing, reporting, and so on. But also, uh, although perhaps slightly less than there used to be, 
uh, there are some appalling sort of tabloid excesses. Complete fairy stories get into the press quite often, and so do some very manipulative methods. I think they're off the agenda now, but telephone tapping and so on. Mm. But I think more seriously than that is that the British press is basically uh, at least fairly responsible, and most of it very responsible, but it's been weakened hugely by other factors which are very little economics of the press. So everyone knows, I think, that most papers are losing money to this day. They're usually subsidised by other parts of the uh, owning company's empire. Uh, secondly, um, there's huge competition. Um, there were only three or four television channels at the time when I was every day big in the headlines. Now there are something like 50 easily available channels. And then social media has erupted across everyone's life. And there's an enormous amount of news in social media. Uh, pretty unreliable, that news, um, often. But uh, nevertheless, the panoply of news sources has magnified out of all recognition. So the press uh, are much weaker than they were. You mentioned social media. Um, we have this phenomena that's come to light in, in recent years, this idea of fake news. Um, it started off as a very specific term back in 2016 when there were a lot of websites in Macedonia pumping false stories into Facebook. Uh, today, it's moved from that specific term to being a general smear. I don't like what you're saying, therefore, you fake news. I mean, we had uh, the recent president of the United States accusing a, a, a an accredited journalist of, from, a, from a major broadcasting network. You know, he, he asks him a question, he says, you are fake news. What, what's your take on fake news? Is it any worse than what used to be called spin doctoring? Is it any worse than um, questionable messages on sides of buses about uh, the NHS and Brexit? I think it is worse. I mean, fake news often means false news and some people do manipulate false news into the media. If you want a very topical example um, of a politician who led the world astray only briefly, President Macron of France uh, asserted uh, only a few days ago that the British vaccine uh, was useless for people over 65. Uh, tests have now turned the evidence beyond doubt that that statement, maybe it was made in good faith, but it turned out completely wrong. Um, so that's one form of fake news. Uh, but just sticking, for example, with the top of the subject of vaccines, on social media, there's been fantastic amount of conspiracy theory news about the vaccines, about whether they work or don't work, or indeed whether the um, British government is in a conspiracy with the drug companies to promote this vaccine or that vaccine. So there's fantastic nonsense out there uh, on the uh, news waves, and some of it is fake and quite seriously fake. And why people make it fake, uh, I think this goes far beyond spinning. And you can't often tell who is making up the fake news. If President Macron says, I'm going to see that, who's that's come from. But a lot of stuff on social media, uh, the, these are names like uh, Newshound or some anonymous <laughs> name. Sounds rather authoritative. News hand is good new man. News hand actually screwing out. You should take that one. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so I think there's, it's harder to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff or the lies mm. from the truth in journalism. And uh, nowadays, I mean, we have a situation where a lie can get halfway around the world before truth can get its shoes on. And this, I think, is a new era of whatever it's called false news, fake news. And those who uh, watch the media or watch the, uh, the channels of um, IT and so on, they've got to be much more discerning. You, you meant, you've mentioned a lot, a lot there in your, in your overview, uh, not, least, not least the importance of what politicians are saying. You, you, you quote uh, President Macron of France, uh, and as you rightly say, um, not all of the stories we get at are, are accredited. They are hidden behind uh, anonymity, or, uh, often with sort of pressure groups or special interest groups or lobby groups, uh, spinning stories, fake news, conspiracy theories, etc. 
Let's turn to our government and, and their handling of pandemic, if we may. We, we are, have heard just yesterday of the, of the roadmap out of um, coronavirus or out of COVID-19, out of lockdown. Um, but over the weeks, the government have, have seemed to have tr been wrestling with, with the social and the medical implications and also the economic implications of lockdown. Um, sometimes that messaging has been a bit confusing. I would suggest that um, if we're following the science, um, the suggestion that actually we'd all have five days off over Christmas uh, is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, um, of course, in the event we didn't, but as a politician and as a journalist, how would you have advised the government about its messaging over the coronavirus pandemic? Well, I'm not sure I'd have done any better than the um, uh, <clears throat> present government has. Uh, let's give it some credit. Um, I don't believe anybody, the scientists or Boris Johnson or ministers and spokesmen, ever went out there intending to mislead anybody. They did sometimes give out wrong information. They did sometimes uh, get too optimistic in their forecasts. But I had the impression throughout that here were decent, truthful guys all trying to comment sensibly and govern sensibly in what was an unprecedented situation in which the flow of information was often very, very difficult to interpret correctly. So I wouldn't criticize um, anybody for getting things wrong. They did, uh, but I think they got them wrong in good faith. Uh, nobody was sort of cooking the books. No one was really spinning. They were wrestling with a tumultuous flow of slightly confusing information and doing their best. Uh, if I, with the wisdom of hindsight, so easy. I think Boris Johnson was optimistic too easily, too quickly. Um, but I think so were probably for a time his scientists. They thought that when the first lockdown had a good effect, probably they were on their way to conquering the problem. And so there was a huge surge. I hope they're right now, I believe they are, thanks to the amazing success of the British vaccine program. Uh, but I think so we probably are genuinely conquering. But even now, I think it is possible that uh, Boris Johnson and team may have been a little too optimistic about some of the things they think are gonna happen. Maybe uh, it's gonna be better than they think, uh, in which case they'd be wrong again. But I think they have always, spoken in good faith so i have no criticism of them i suppose it's difficult to have a perfect answer in an imperfect situation um and of course there are those people who don't believe the government because they don't trust the government uh, and and it's when you don't trust that an alter alternative facts <laughs> as they're called or fake news uh, comes is more likely to come about how easy is it to believe somebody if you don't trust them? How, how absolutely symbiotic, how interdependent are the concepts of truth and trust? Well, I think it's obviously it's fundamental to a good democracy that the people trust the government and believe the government is speaking truth. Uh, that's uh, been undermined uh, to a great degree by several factors. Uh, first of all, if you say go back to World War II, people trusted what Churchill was saying. And he was speaking most of the time the truth, but there were certain times when the truth was at least suppressed for a considerable time. Uh, but people trusted the government of the day and we were a more trusting nation and, and public than we are today. Today, we're very, very questioning, very doubting, very suspicious. Uh, and I slightly think it's more that we have become a society more mistrusting, uh, more suspicious than the, the politicians have got much worse. Of course, when they do realize, uh, as I did, or when the government is obviously spinning, the crazy vaccine story. I mean, I think, as far as any of us can tell, uh, the British government 
have played the vaccine story absolutely straight. And if anything, they've underestimated the success of it. Uh, so a fault on the right side, they've not boosted, not predicted as well as they might have done. Um, but um, there's still plenty of people out there who um, don't believe the truth about the vaccines. I referred earlier to how social media is pumping up stuff about conspiracy with the drug companies. Um, and so there is um, a lot of mistrust. And I, I think it's not necessarily the politician's fault. Uh, it's perhaps part of having a much more suspicious society. Ah, you say it's not the politician's fault. But is truth, sorry, is trust in what our politicians telling us ever undermined by the behaviour, the personal behaviour of cabinet ministers and other honourable and right honourable members of parliament? Oh, definitely. I mean, I will always have on my conscience <clears throat> the fact that as a cabinet minister, I was caught out telling a lie. Mm. I hope I was not then or now. Uh, someone who could be called a serial liar, who tells lies all the time. Uh, but I did, definitely did tell a lie. And that, of course, undermines uh, people's trust in not just me, but to a certain extent in the whole structure. And that's something I have to live in to have contributed to that. And you're absolutely right to say, well, um, uh, all breaches of truth or trust do damage the whole edifice of trust in government. Uh, as against all that, I think politicians um, do, do actually reflect society. Uh, we are a less truthful society on things like business expenses than we used to be. And in a way, uh, the House of Commons probably has in it, not a 660 saints who never tell a lie, it has 660 flawed people who do things from time to time which are wrong, including telling lies or including behaving badly. Um, does this shatter the whole edifice of government? Um, I think the public are more sophisticated than that. They see that um, you know, politicians are human, that what's and all, that every saloon bar editor is represented in the House of Commons, so every so exaggerator of a good story is represented in the House of Commons and so on. Uh, so we get the politicians we elect, to a large extent, we deserve. Uh, so I, I think uh, pointing a finger at the politicians, we sometimes point a finger in our own mirrors. So, so when we say that they are elected representatives, we're not only speaking, or we're not only using that term in a sort of political sense, that they are a a political voice in the place of power, but they actually was representing us in the way that we as the electorate behaves, our attitudes. Um, so they, they, they're, re they're representative of fellow human beings because they themselves are not paragons of virtue. I think that's true. On the other hand, I think once you are elected to an office of public trust and a councillor or a member of parliament or cabinet is that, I think it's right to remember a wonderful phrase of Edmund Burke's about MPs. Uh, we sit on a conspicuous stage and the whole world marks our demeanour. In other words, the whole world is watching us. Yeah. And I think therefore you have to raise your game in terms of good behaviour, truthfulness and so on. And the fact that some of us fail uh, is again part of human nature. But I think it would be wise, if I was advising young politician, I'd say, keep that Burke quotation in mind. Indeed. Another area in which truth and trust are inseparable is religion. What distinctives do you think that the Christian narrative can bring to the concepts of truth and of trust? Well, the Christian narrative is fundamentally, and at its bedrock, a religion of trust and belief in God's truth. So it's absolutely central. Um, the uh, religions of the world and the Christian religion in particular uh, did not invent a whole lot of falsehoods. Um, they asked people to believe in fundamental truths. And, uh, and that was certainly what 
we all in the Christian world do believe. So I, I think you're right to say, is it important, is it fundamental to religion? Yes, it is. Yes, it should be. Again, we have individual failures in the religious world. Um, but on the whole, I think those who seek to serve God in any capacity, um, but particularly as uh, ministers of religion or, uh, say, the Salvation Army or anywhere else who has what's called a ministry, I think they're under special duty to honour the fundamental uh, basis in that, which is to be truthful and trustful, especially as they proclaim God's message. So, so as whereas we wouldn't uh, necessarily expect uh, politicians to to hold uh, such um, values almost as a job description, we do expect those in ministries to be honourable people, people of trust, and, and people who speak the truth. Definitely, I think when you answer God's call, you answer a call to the duty of serving God and ways that would please him and bear on that list would be to always uh, be truthful and trustful and being ordained as a servant of God uh, and I hope and pray that my standards are much much higher than they were when I was a politician. Indeed so. Now Christianity presents the Bible as true and Jesus as the truth. Uh, what convinces you that the Bible is true and that Jesus is the truth? Well, first of all, I have a massive faith in the Bible as a, and God's word as a, a source of truth. And um, in the, there in the middle of the Bible, uh, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, so John's gospel again, his word is truth. If you go back to the old, Testament, and 19 things like that are central to faith, belief, and the Bible. Um, what makes me convinced, well, not just reading it to the page, um, but um, of course I watch every day and watch in my own life uh, how God's promises uh, are true because they are fulfilled. And I could go into that at greater length, but uh, basically I think the evidence for God's word being true is all around us in daily life and we can find countless examples uh, of how uh, the promises are true. If I was to say something about my own life, um, I am Please. astonished to do, um, having been sitting in a prison cell for lying um, uh, 21 years ago. Um, I never thought it would never cross my mind it would come now to be an ordained priest and prison chaplain. How did this happen? Um, it really wasn't my doing, but God, I think, does make certain promises. God says to every individual, I love you. God says to every individual, if you commit sins and are repentant, I'm willing to forgive you. God says, I'm willing to transform you. God says, I'm willing to lift you up. God says, I'm willing to give you work to do for me. Um, those are his promises. Um, and in my own life, they have been not just fulfilled, but uh, generously um, implemented in a way that I can hardly believe still, but I pinch myself very so often, uh, yeah. think that this has happened. And so if you say to me, are God's promises true? I can only sort of sound in my breath, well, look at me. Yeah, I, I was a really bad swimmer, <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. I hope I'm a good servant of the Lord now, and yeah. that is a you, blessing of a promise to come true. You you once described yourself uh, as a, a, not a born again Christian, but a failed again Christian, and and is and is that is that the is that the sign that of the grace of God. It's the grace of God that has made you the person you are today. In a, in a not, perhaps in a not dissimilar way to which God dealt with one of your biography um, uh, subjects, John Newton, who uh, you mentioned earlier, but of course you mentioned him in terms of his, his being um, in prison, but actually you didn't mention that he was a slave trader 
and God broke into his life, uh, reformed him in, from the inside, and his behaviour changed dramatically. And and that was and he goes on, of course, to write about Amazing Grace. Do you see a parallel in your own life, as you rightly say, somebody who was in jail for lying now handling the word of truth and that's all down to god's amazing grace well i don't think i can touch the hem of john newton's garment uh, in comparison. <laughs> but um certainly john newton was a slave trader it was a very bad young man a blasphemer he was a deserter from the royal navy he was jailed he was flogged he was a really very bad character and a slave ship captain uh, and so he did many, many very, very bad things. But God transformed it. God changed it. Uh, and God does this all the time. Um, some of the disciples are pretty ropey characters, at least for some yeah. of the time. Um, and uh, Peter, who did all kinds of bad things, including denying Christ three times, became the rock on which the church was founded. So God's grace, I mean, uh, I'm not sure you can um, work uh, your your passage uh, to be a, a redeemed and changed person. Grace is a gift. Um, I think you can position yourself perhaps where God thinks you're worth giving the grace to, but you can't earn grace. You can't work for grace. Yeah. Grace comes as a gift from God, and whether it's me or John Newton or any amount of people you can think of, um, I think gratitude is the order of the day not patting yourself on the back saying how well I've done. And that's right, yeah. I mean, at its heart, Christianity is, is not about believing a set of promises. It's about a relationship with one person, isn't it? It's about trusting Jesus. Yes. You have, you have come on a, a journey and a path that few people will have, will have journeyed. What evidence, what convinces you that Jesus is somebody who is worth trusting? With your life? Well, first of all, uh, on a um, just learning level, I think you should study God's Word, as I certainly have done. I went off to college uh, three years or something, I, joke. I changed uh, from being in a prison cell to go to the only place in, place in Britain which had worse food and worse plumbing than a prison, more uncomfortable beds, which was a theological college in Anglican. Theological college, <laughs> wonderful place, quickly full wonderful teachers, but um, so I think uh, just studying Jesus's teachings, you come to a conclusion, which actually many agnostics have come to, that there are no finer teachings of ethics in the world. But of course, it's not about ethics. Uh, it is about uh, learning to love and trust and obey Jesus and his teachings. And um, how it happened to me, I really don't to this day quite know. Amazing people came alongside me, taught me, guided me. But in the end, I think the Holy Spirit came along and mysteriously and bafflingly entered my heart. And so, so did uh, Jesus Christ himself mm. and started to carry out changes which I would never have dreamed possible. So um, it happened. Uh, and I give myself zero credit for it. I know you want to avoid, I know you want to avoid um, the, the old Jonathan Aitken, um, uh, but even in, the par even in the parable of the prodigal son, w there is a moment where, where the guy comes to his senses, you know, he came to himself, and it's in that moment, you know, and I'm, I, that, that actually, yeah, I'm actually, I could go back to my dad, and then he sees his father running towards him. Now, I just wonder, was there a moment, either before you went to trial, while you sat in prison, somewhere in that storm that you went through, was there a moment when you came to yourself, you realised a few home truths about telling lies, and you thought, I could be better than this? I wish I could answer by saying there was one, hallelujah, bingo, it's <laughs> moment. Uh, some good Christian speakers can. With me, the journey was much more of a rocky road of stumbling, sinning, backsliding, wondering whether I was going crazy, turning up at these uh, church meetings to pray. Lots of negatives, 
But there was one enormous positive, which was that somehow or other, I kept going on the road of seeking to build a prayerful relationship with Jesus. And there were wonderful moments on that road. For example, I went along as an almost total cynic for the Holy Spirit weekend on an Alpha course. So the one thing is absolutely impossible in the unlikely um, uh, surroundings of the Chatsworth Hotel and weren't even that this dull lawyer will call down the Holy Spirit and you'll get nowhere near me. <laughs> <laughs> 30 minutes later, I was bursting into tears, feeling the power of the Holy Spirit. So I could point to all kinds of dramatic moments uh, which might qualify for the Nigel test of being able to say, yes, that was it. But actually, it was a, a journey, a journey with many uh, mistakes on the journey. And yet, rather like somebody uh, crossing uh, the frontiers of old Asia, uh, you actually didn't know uh, when you had crossed a frontier, but you did know when you were in the new country of a real and committed faith. And I think I knew that about a month or two or three before I actually went into prison. I had been a long wait of almost two years from the moment of being caught out telling the lie in the libel case and actually standing in the dock of the bed. And during that time, some wonderful people came alongside me and had enormous good influence. In the end, Jonathan, we're going to, Jonathan, we're going to move to, to uh, viewers' questions in a moment. But my, my last question for Nat, um, just to sum up our, um, you know, wrap up this, this, this part of the conversation. Um, after the trial or around the trial, you, you, you said, because it was true, you had lost everything. You'd lost your job. You lost your then wife because you went through divorce. You lost trust. You lost position. You lost your place on the Privy Council. You lost your reputation. You lost a fortune. You lost a future. How easy has it been to forgive people who went after you? And how easy has it been to forgive yourself? Um, surprisingly, not nearly as difficult as I thought it would be. Um, let's get the um, uh, other people out of the way. Mm -hmm. Not easy. So all these things take time. But um, uh, I don't suppose he's watching it, but the editor of The Guardian at the time was called Alan Rusbridge. was one of my yeah. strongest pursuers. And actually, he's rather a good friend now. We uh, work together on one particularly important issue, um, sort of trying to fight all bad forces in the College of Christchurch, fighting for the Christian Dean. But we work together uh, and we cooperate. And I think we both like each other and trust each other. So that's a big... Uh, and uh, so there were, uh, but there were plenty of other people who perhaps didn't uh, treat me well at the time who well, I've long since had no uh, forgiveness problem. Forgiving myself, um, I often meet people in prison who say, I can't forgive myself. Um, and especially if I'm meeting them, as sometimes I'm in the chapel, I say, do you believe that God can be? Oh, yes, yes, I do. I say, well, hang on. Um, if you believe that, um, uh, if you think God can forgive you, how on earth can you think that you can't forgive yourself? That's an absolutely logical argument, uh, which quite a few people, and even perhaps you from your question, think that I might not be able to forgive myself. Uh, actually, perhaps I can't forgive myself, but I don't worry about that at all, um, because um, I've been forgiven by the source of true forgiveness uh, and all truth and all power. So why worry about things I uh, still have twinges about, and I do, um, I do believe I've been forgiven by the greatest power of all. And so, of course, I've long since worrying about forgiving myself. Thank you, Jonathan. That's, that's absolutely splendid um, to hear from you and to hear about the grace of God, about the change in your own life, about your views on politics today and faith and uh, fake news. And we've got loads of questions, as you might imagine. We have now 14 minutes. Here we go. First thing is, Jonathan, uh, one of our viewers asks, how can we resolve the tension between the right to free speech and dangerously deceptive lies such as the anti-vax movement? 
Um, John Milton uh, once wrote a great line saying, whoever saw truth put to flight by true and open encounter. What I take that to mean is that, yes, there will often be lies flying around, but in the end, it's the truth that comes out. And the anti-vax movement, full of rumors and conspiracy theories, uh, I don't think it's doing very well um, because um, they believe in scientific truth, which uh, we're told is of supreme importance in the coronavirus pandemic. The tests are more and more showing how reliable the vaccine is. Also, more and more people, including who started as anti-vaxxers, seem to be trickling into uh, the vaccination rooms. So I'd say truth will out. Okay, thank you. Truth will out. Okay, let's try this one. Again, a similar, a similar topic of, of fake news and, and conspiracy theory. Uh, how would you advise young people to guard themselves from easily believing fake news and helping to spread manipulated information? I think I'd say go to the source. First of all, can you know, do you know who the source is? Uh, if the source is uh, John Smith, special correspondent mm. for help of the time, well, you know he is, he's got an editor on top of him. Uh, if it's uh, sort of the grave digger blog or something, you don't know who that is, why he's saying it. So first is look, at the credibility of the source. Uh, then ask the kind of questions which an intelligent person would. W what is the collateral evidence for saying vaccines don't work? Um, or that they are no use for people over 65, as President Macron so unwisely said, it looks pretty silly now. Um, what is the supplementary? So go for the source, go for the evidence, and use your own IQ to ask stronger and better questions. And that's one way of finding what is true and what is untrue. There you have a, a questioner, use your own intelligence. Okay, Jonathan, to what extent has the 24 seven news cycle, you know, this constant monster that needs to be fed with news, even when there isn't anything news, uh, how, is, how much has that fed in, uh, been feeding into the concept of fake news? Is, you know, put it another way, is fake news a byproduct of the relentless 24-7 news cycle? I think to some extent it is. That relentless high pressure to get first with the news. Um, uh, I remember I worked for a great editor in Fleet Street called Charles Winter, editor of this Evening Standard. And he always used to ask, have you checked this? Have you double-checked? Have you gone back? And I remember him once saying to me, if we can't if we can't check, we don't print. Hmm. Um, well, I'm afraid the 24 news cycle makes double checking uh, because it takes time and so to get first with the news, maybe with the fake news. Um, and so exciting rumors get given credibility much, much more easily than they used to. And so I think the 24 hour news cycle does have a part part to play in the growth news and the repetition of inaccurate news. It's one of the villains. Wait, let's stay with news in a minute. We're going to, we're going to move to the sort of the religious uh, themed questions. Let's stay with news for, for, for a moment. Where do you stand on press regulation? I mean, since, since you were accused of, uh, falsely accused of all sorts of things, being an arms dealer, uh, being a pimp and so on. Um, there has been press inquiries, there has been the Levison inquiry in particular that took up so much time, energy and money. Where do you stand? Should the press be regulated or self-regulated? I think it's a fairly good idea to have uh, not so much regulatory bodies, but watchdogs who uh, people can complain to. Of course, there is the law which people can of defamation, people can take cases to court. Uh, but on the whole, um, a free press sometimes includes the freedom to make mistakes. Um, and there are limits on press freedom. The famous US judge who said freedom of speech does not include 
uh, the freedom to shout and fire in a crowded theatre. Mm. <clears throat> sometimes there are false stories which are almost equivalent to shouting fire in a crowded theatre. <clears throat> but on the whole, I don't really, I, I'm not a great believer in um, state regulation, God forbid, um, or um, I, I think light touch regulation. Um, and um, I think it's better for optical reasons not done by the press itself. It's better done by people who are independent of the press themselves. I think part of the old press council was yeah. they were all appointed by big newspaper groups. So I think independence of the regulator is very important. But I'm not an over-regulator because I don't believe it works. Okay. Let's move to politics. Uh, a question that asks, how do you view the grilling of uh, commentators, I hope you feel you've been grilled tonight, uh, that uh, commentators often give to politicians. Are these efforts to catch uh, MPs out helpful or do they foster a culture of negativ negativism and mistrust? I think um, a competent politician should be able to get his message across without being afraid of uh, fierce interrogations fierce and courteous interrogations, I can say, <clears throat> because it's no point having a, an abusive interrogator. But a good uh, interrogator, a good questioner, whether it's on television or something as agreeable as tonight, can get, a, get there, I think. And the politician or the answer of the questions should be able to give a reasonable account of themselves without being fearful about um, anything going badly wrong. Enoch Powell used to say, politicians who don't like the press are like sea captains who don't like the sea. You ought to be able to cope with rough water, rough questioning, and still make progress. You're making progress tonight, I'll tell you. Here's another one. Um, many people don't trust the government, this government or any government. Do you think there are truly any honest politicians or are they mostly self-serving and corrupt? I absolutely do not think that most politicians are self-serving and corrupt. There may be a few rotten apples here and there, but uh, basically most people who go into Parliament, go into public life, do so with rather good ideals. Why do they want to go? <clears throat> it's not wonderfully well paid. Um, it's um, a lot of tough pressures on you. Um, why do it? I think most of them do it because they have a genuine ideal of public service. <clears throat> now, there are many other factors, the vanity, the publicity, yes, yes, yes. But basically, at heart, there is a very, very little, um, I think, uh, you know, corruption uh, too. It's extremely difficult, <clears throat> quite about anything else, to be corrupt as a politician. Um, the civil service are vigilant watchdogs, prevent ministers on the whole don't have a place, must know contracts or business. They don't, the, the, the whole system. Uh, and if you actually think about British government, point to me in the, the number of real corruption scandals in living memory. Astonishingly few. I mean, if my hotel bill in the Ritz Hotel is what you can produce as corruption, well, it was bad, but it ain't very high on the scale yeah. of, uh, you know, wicked corruptions. Uh, yeah. And, um, and that, that, I think, seems to be true of, you know, a lot of politicians do wrong things. But I, I can't remember when I last heard of a politician or a judge taking a bribe, anything like that, um, or becoming very rich as a result of um, uh, some decision they'd wrongly taken. I think we're very blessed in this country that on the whole, the system is uh, well pleased, well watchdog, and pretty honest. So I don't at all buy the idea that politicians are venal and corrupt. You raise some issues that I'd love to go into, but I'm going to let the, the viewers speak. Uh, let, we're going to move on from that because I, I would like to raise uh, bring to you this one. We're thinking about faith and truth. Would you say that other religions, other than Christianity, such as Islam or Hinduism, are less true than Christianity? Well, they have their own paths. And 
I am reluctant to get into saying, well, I can find this or this verse in the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, I actually get on very well with my uh, Muslim and Sikh and Hindu colleagues in prison ministry. I actually preached in the mosque in Pendleville Prison. I didn't have any other Christian priest who came and invited to <laughs> preach in the mosque. And I can always find something in common uh, with other faiths, or usually I can. <clears throat> but do I disagree sometimes with some of the things that the um, other faiths say? Yes, I do. And no point going into them here. Uh, and I do believe that um, the truths spoken by Jesus Christ are the supreme truths. Um, but that is a Christian belief, Christian faith. <clears throat> but I, not at all a, a knocker of other faiths and other paths to grace. Who knows? How would you say that God has worked through you in your prison work? I mean, you, you rightly say, you know, you have been, you, you've sat where some of these guys now sit. You have heard the door slam behind you. Uh, and, and you have had harrowing nights and worrying days uh, as an inmate. So, but how is God working through you in your current role? And are you able to share an example? Well, for example, today in Pendleville Prison, uh, I sat down with a minister of religion who had been convicted of uh, a sexual sex offense. And um, I saw a really utterly broken man. Um, and we talked for the best part of an hour. And I was able to, and rather interestingly, he started to say at the beginning of our conversation, there were no real victims in my case at all. Um, and by the end of the hour, I think I had made him see, just partly talking only about myself. Um, in a way, there were no real victims. I might have asserted in my case, but of course my family and so on, not for six. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, from having been a prisoner, I find it very easy to connect and have a rapport with those in prison. Also, once they've got over my hot dog collar and my Eton and Oxford accent, <laughs> and I told them that I was a prisoner and they believed me. We then again, <laughs> and, and I think communicating God's love God's forgiveness, God's truth. Um, that's my job. Um, and it isn't a quick or easy job, but I love the pastoral work, work of talking to someone who's done something really bad and helping them perhaps, first of all, to see how bad it was that may be part of the job, or how much they could be loved and forgiven by God, or how they could have a future and a different to the one they thought. And I was talking to today, I'll never be a minister of religion again, but he may be still a servant of God in most unexpected ways. <laughs> so look at me. Um, I would never believe that. So, so, uh, I'll ask our last question for this evening, Jonathan. And, and thank you for, so much for your candor and your openness and your truthfulness tonight. Uh, last question. Uh, how do you feel that your difficult times have deepened your personal relationship with God? Enormously. Um, there's a verse from Isaiah I'm rather fond of. It's Isaiah 45, verse 3. And it goes, I will give you treasures of darkness, riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord. Now, I know something about darkness and dark places, but I also know that in them um, you can learn and discover these treasures which show you the power of God's love. And that, I think, happened to me. It can happen to anyone. Um, but it is a wonderful gift and wonderful treasure, which I think if you seek, you will find it. And on that note, Jonathan Aitken, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. This has been Questions of Our Times with my guest, the Reverend Jonathan Aitken. <laughs>